Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is Rachel Vesputa. I'm the Tri-State Fair Project Director. I want to thank you all for joining us for today's webinar. In uh, light of the current COVID situation, we decided uh, again to move forward with a virtual field training webinar uh, in place of our in-person field training workshops that we had planned for the summer. Just to let everybody know, we are recording the webinar uh, today, which will be posted on our website uh, and the Yukon Extension YouTube channel as well. Uh, so you can certainly reference that in the future for some further learning if you'd like. The PowerPoint presentation and the links to the videos from the farm uh, that will be shown today will also be posted on our website in the future <coughs> for you to reference as well. So to decrease the background noise while we're, while we're recording today, we have muted everybody who is on the call. Uh, so of course, please bring up your uh, chat screen. Um, if it's not already showing on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, uh, you can go ahead and hover over your main uh, screen there down right about where I'm uh, holding my cursor now. And you should see one of the buttons uh, is a chat function. If you go ahead and click on that, uh, it should populate the chat box at the bottom right hand corner of your screen. That will allow us to communicate back and forth with each other today. There'll also be links there um, for you to click on to see videos. And uh, that is also the way that we'll get to our pre and post evaluation for the day as well. Be sure that you're in the chat section and not in the Q&A section. Um, if you're having trouble, certainly feel free to send an email uh, to Mackenzie White. Her email uh, information was in the link uh, to log in uh, through the email that Jean King sent you earlier. The workshop uh, today, the virtual training, is part of the Tri-State Fair Professional Development Project, which is funded through the USDA and Northeast Fair. It's a collaborative project among the universities of Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. We're in the third year of the project, and we're focusing our efforts this year on pasture management and infrastructure. The classroom workshops um, have wrapped up and concluded for the year. And again, we've made the decision to adjust all of our field training workshops uh, for this year to a virtual setting. So we're going to be using videos, photos, and uh, webinars. Unfortunately, the July workshop has been canceled, although we do hope to get to Watson Farm in Jamestown, Rhode Island in the future. Uh, but the August workshop at UMass will be proceeding much uh, the same way and in the same fashion as today's workshop is. So later on this week, we'll be sending out an email announcement regarding that workshop with the link to register. Um, and we'll also send that out as, as the workshop approaches as well. For those of you guys who have joined us in um, our previous webinars this year, our participant feedback and the group discussion will be very familiar to you. Um, I first want to thank everybody who has already sent in their questions in advance to today's webinar. It's allowed us to kind of tailor uh, the specific details and topics that are covered today. And then, of course, feel free to submit further questions uh, as the presentation goes on today right into the chat box, because we have allocated some time into the agenda for some Q&A. Again, make sure, just one more reminder that we're in chat and not in that Q&A section. And then if nothing else, uh, if you don't have, if you have a specific question that comes up that doesn't get answered or comes to mind after today's presentation, I certainly would hope that uh, you get in contact with me and I would be happy to get uh, some answers for you. All right, so uh, the participant evaluation today is gonna be much the same as it has been in the past. Uh, webinars earlier this year. We'll be using Slido. Um, so if you go ahead and take a look at the chat box now, you should see a link to Slido. Uh, you can go ahead and click on. 
Once you click on it, it will be you'll be asked to enter uh, your access code, which is SARE, capital S A R E. From there, it should take you to a series of a few questions uh, that once you get to the bottom, you can go ahead and click submit. Uh, it's a green box. And then um, after that, we'll come back to, to our presentation. If you have any trouble connecting, of course, certainly type in the chat box and we can help you trouble. So I'll go ahead now and give you just a few minutes um, to get that together and take the evaluation questions. See a few answers coming in. So we I know we've made it there, or some people have at least. So I'll give us all a few more minutes to get those questions answered. All right, I think we're going to move forward um, in interest of time. Of course, if there's anybody who um, was having trouble connecting, I can certainly, I'm happy to send those evaluation questions um, after the workshop today as well. So uh, certainly more opportunity to fill those answers out uh, in the future. We will be doing a post evaluation as well today um, at the end of our workshop uh, in much the same fashion that we use uh, with Slido. All right. So before we get moving, I just want to take a few minutes to introduce the farm that we will be virtually touring today, and then we can begin. Jenny and Dan Kepsukevich own and operate Stonehill Farm, a small grass-fed, pasture-raised beef operation in Plainfield, Connecticut, with their three children. With the use of intensive grazing practices, their animals are well fed and their soil health continues to improve. Hay fields that were once pure timothy stands are now lush pastures with diversified grass species. Throughout the summer months, tall grass and high density grazing support soil moisture content and pasture regrowth during periods of drought. So with that, I'm just give us a few moments to switch over to Jenny. Um, and I'll let her take it away. <clears throat> okay. Hi, everybody. Can everyone hear me? Yes. All right. Excellent. Can you see my screen? 
Yes, you just probably want to put it on presentation mode and yep. be good. I just wanted to make sure we were there. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Jenny. I am um, the Jenny of Jenny and Dan Kepsikevich. Um, as Rachel introduced us, we own a small farm in Plainfield. So I'm going to just tell you right now, I am a people person. So, um, and I like to stand. And so right now I can't see anyone's faces and I'm sitting. So this is, um, we're all getting used to a new format and a way to teach and learn and discover new things. So please have patience with me as I um, navigate WebEx, the platform we're using, as well as provide information about our farm. So without further ado, um, I have a couple hopes for you actually. Um, my first one is, is that you will keep an open mind throughout this presentation. Um, our method is not the right way or the only way, but it's the way that meets our farm's personal mission and vision. So um, you might have different practices or maybe you're coming um, as a professional to learn more about something different. And I just ask that you keep an open mind about what we do here and realize that it has applications um, for you. So I mentioned that um, we visit a lot of farms. We go to a lot of conferences. We travel the country because we are very passionate about what we are doing in terms of grass fed grazing. And I can tell you that no matter what kind of farm we were on, whether it was conventional farming practices, whether it was um, grass grazing practices in South Dakota, where you know they're on um, dry land, we have taken something, at least one thing away from every farm we have ever visited. Sometimes it might have been a gate latch. <clears throat> Sometimes it was an entire philosophy. So I just want you to remember that everywhere we went or everywhere we go we always keep our eyes open and our ears ready to listen because you just never know when you might hear that one thing or see that one thing that you could apply for yourself so um secondly i want you to hear that one new thing today and that i want you to um, explore it further or perhaps try it and then that you will continue learning and making effective change on your farm or in your role. So I know that we have some people logged on who are farmers. I also know that we have people who are logged on who are in the, um, have the opportunity to train a new generation of farmers. So I encourage you to always um, keep an open mind and be prepared that, you know, it might take you in a direction you didn't initially anticipate. So a little bit about who we are and how we got here. Um, my husband, Dan, it grew, was the fourth generation to milk on his family's dairy farm. At the head of production, they were milking over 250 head of dairy cattle here in Plainfield. Um, he always felt though that the herd was sick, that they were always treating for something, whether it was hooves or um, illness or whatever you, you have, he felt that they were always sick. He also felt that um, they were always in debt and that the farm um, was constantly paying grain bills and, you know, he didn't have any solutions. He was in high school and it wasn't his farm. He was just a hand. And, but, you know, he always had this, you know, feeling in his gut. And then he went off to college. We met, we married, and we decided that we wanted to buy a large parcel of land. Little did I know that that meant I was going to farm because I did not grow up in a farming family. I grew up um, in the construction world, so I did grow up around machinery and equipment, and you know certainly can save myself on it, you know, out on the farmland. But um, I didn't have animals or know anything about them. So we found a piece of property in Plainfield, and I'm telling you this story because I feel it's really important as a reflection of what young, the young generation of farmers are faced against when they want to do something in terms of agriculture, because um, land is expensive and getting access to it is hard and infrastructure is also costly. So um, we found a piece of property. It happened to be owned by his grandfather and we didn't have enough money and we couldn't find a lender. So we walked away from it. Three years later, the property was still on the market his grandfather now was desperate to pay um, grain debt. And so we were able to make payments to him until we could get the cost of the, 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 cost of the property low enough that we could um, get a loan for it. And so hence that's where Stonehill Farm was born. And um, we are raising our three children here. We purchased our property in 2003 
and we started hay production uh, for a cash crop in 2008 and animals came on shortly later. We did not have a vision to have animals on our property when we first started out. It's just something that happened. And I, I mentioned that because, you know, I think we all start out with an idea and our ideas change. And as we learn more, they grow and we develop into um, the farmers that we are today. So, um, I was trying to figure out how I could capture our farm for you. And I even did a whole video series of our farm from different angles and then got worried that um, our farm, the video wouldn't play properly. Um, Mackenzie, how do I get rid of this box in the corner? I'm, I'm not seeing your box. So. Okay, but you can see my screen. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. So instead of decided to utilize Google Earth. So this is a obviously a overhead picture, a satellite image of our farm. Um, and so our home is right here in the center where I'm kind of circling. You can see my mouse, I hope. <clears throat> our, our house is right here. <clears throat> this is, um, you can clearly see it on the screen. This is our sacrifice area. We have a small um, cattle shed for a run-in. And um, we have a water source here as well as down here. And then way up in the front of our property, we have another water source. All that is green. All of it is um, now pastured acreage. We have um, kind of a gentle sloping lot and then some wooded area down below. And then we have some wet spots. So I appreciate some of the questions that came in ahead of time because um, I'm, I think I'm able to address how we approached some problems on our own farm. So thank you for that. All right, hang on. Okay, so keeping track, this is one of the most important things we did early on and it was about grazing records. So um, when somebody first told me that I should do this and we were at a conference and I was like, you know what, I've read the books, I know what I'm doing, you know, we'll figure it out. So I decided to keep track anyway. And um, the first year we did it. So I, I have in front of you my actual grazing plans. So on the left side of your screen, you're gonna see the grazing plan that I had for 2014 and 2015. I overlaid them. This box on the left-hand side represents a 2.5 acre lot. That was our first grazable portion of our land. And the yellow highlighter that's running down created four long strips. I thought I was grass grazing and I put two animals out onto that strip and I couldn't feed them. It, they ate it right to the dirt. It was awful. Um, I would press my pigtails into the ground. And so that's the, the um, equipment that I use. And I couldn't even get them to break the surface. The dirt was so compacted. I actually had to have my husband come in behind me to step them in so that his weight would push them into the ground. And so then lo and behold, at the end of that season, we attended a grass conference in New York. And from that, I went, oh, I need more paddocks. So in 2015, I implemented 12 paddocks on the same footprint. And suddenly my animals couldn't keep up any longer. Um, I added more animals to that um, grazing plan. And then in 2016, same footprint on the right hand side, same 2.5 acres. I then increased it to 19 grazing paddocks. Um, and I, I'm gonna pause here for a minute to mention something that if people come to your farm and give recommendations, it's really hard sometimes to take a deep breath. And someone came out to my farm after I had done the 19 paddocks. And um, I should add that my husband and I work full time off of our farm. So my husband is an engineer and I'm an educator. And so everything that we do on our farm, we do in a way to make it work by working off the farm. So, you know, we're, we do everything nights, holidays and weekends, just like the rest of you all, we finished hay late last night. Um, and then, you know, my husband went to work this morning and I took the day off to do this lecture. So um, everything we do, we try to do to make it work for us and what our particular barriers are. And so for us working away from our farm is a barrier, but we financially can't afford to work on our farm. So this, a gentleman came out and, 
At this point, we were grazing pretty tall, at tall grasses at this point. And um, he said, you know, you need to rotate your herd more often. And I, I almost like burst into tears in that moment because I was like, wow, I've come so long. And, and yes, I would love to rotate my herd more. At that point, I was only rotating them every couple days, um, but that was what I could handle. So fast forward to 2016, I switched to um, this. You cannot appreciate the size of this plan. This plan is probably about four feet by four feet large. It's a piece of paper. It has the entire year on it. Um, and it's on the left hand side, you write your paddocks going down here. So you can see there are my 19 individual paddocks. And then um, my husband allowed me that year to graze October grasses. So we did not take second cut off of our fields. And so he allowed me to graze that area. So that's how come they're labeled hayfield one, two, three, four, so on. And then coming down the center, um, hang on one sec, let's see if I can do this. All right, so coming down the center, you just, um, it's the month, the day, the day of the week, and you fill in the box and go accordingly to how long they were there and when you moved them. What's great about this plan is that if it allows you to project for future years well, because you can see your entire system on one paper. But for me, I suddenly realized that I outgrew the number of columns that I, the number of um, spots I could put my paddocks in. So I did that for two years, that plan. So last year in 2019, I decided that I needed to do something different. And um, I looked into the online versions, you know, um, Graze Map or something like that. And they're too expensive. Um, at a $42 a month subscription, I can't afford that. So that's not going to work for us. Although I love the idea of integrating technology because I can have my cell phone with me. I can go out to the pasture. I can know where I'm at and know what I'm doing. But, um, you know, we all have to make cost decisions and that's out for us. And so I came up with this idea. So again, I'm back to that same Google image from the beginning and I divided it. So um, here, just so you all see it, is that initial 2.5 acres, yeah, that is paddock one. And then I just numbered as I went. Um, 10, 11, and 12 were really large paddocks last year because my husband still couldn't kick the hay habit. He still insisted on um, mowing grass at our own property. He just really struggled to let that one go. And so um, I was only able to graze one time in cells 10, 11, and 12. And then um, we'll talk about how unique 13, 14, and 15 are in a little bit. But what it is is, um, so here is five in the upper right-hand corner. And then I have a um, just a simple eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper that I drew five out on. And then this is how I divide five up. So cell five on this map was really four different grazing paddocks. So I, you can see that the first time they went in there was on five, seven. They, I pulled them out on 5.8, the next time they went back in was 7.12, then 9.5, and then I did a quick, quick capture at the end of the season on 10.16. So that kind of gives you an idea about how our um, records have worked in terms of um, when I put animals in, when I take animals out, um, I write in how many animals are in there. I tend to not carry a grazing stick because um, we do graze high density tall grasses. So sometimes um, a grazing stick becomes obsolete or it's already become obsolete actually on our farm. It's, we're over 36 inches of height. Um, but this is how I do that. So then I decided that I wanted to make it even better. So this year I integrated my grazing map. So over here. They still correspond to the same section on the big map. So this is cell two. I even included that I have a stake site. So one of the unique opportunities we had when I found out that this grazing tour was gonna go virtual is that I started to run around the farm and set in stakes ahead of time so that I could do weekly uh, photo captures of my regrowth. And so um, 
I have now put it into this particular grazing plan. This is just a Word document that I keep and run, and the ones indicate the first graze through, obviously the date, and then the time in, time out. So now I have moved my farm to 12 hour rotations. So I started that probably mid season last year. I recognized that I could manage a morning move and a night move, and I set all of my paddocks up on the weekends so that I'm merely just going out and moving a back line. And I'm gonna talk about my back line in a little bit. But basically my herd is done on, moved on a 12 hour rotation. Um, I should add that our herd is a cow calf operation. So we do an all artificial insemination only program. We do not run a bull. We um, have a herd of registered red Angus and um, we, um, I lost my train of thought, I apologize. I'm not running from notes and maybe I should have, but um, we um, then raise our own meat for slaughter. So we are cow, calf and finishing on our farm. So uh, really quickly, I wanna talk about some optional equipment that we use on a farm to help our practices. So on this slide, I hope you can see it. We use um, heat patches. So this is a picture taken in July. We start our breeding in July on our farm and that is because we intentionally want our calves to arrive in May. The hard part about breeding in July is that it's super hot. And so um, sometimes our conception can be impacted by the heat of the day. And so we've switched our um, breeding program over to nighttime only breeding, but we use heat patches because I can't be here all the time to watch the cows for a heat. We do not run a cleanup bowl. So I do not find a chute to be optional equipment. What is optional is the fact that our chute is on load bars. And so um, we have a scale. So every time we run our animals through our chute, we can weigh them. This was really important in the beginning for us because we felt that, um, you know, we were going back 10 years. So we felt that not everybody believed that you could feed a herd of animals on grass alone. So I mentioned that my husband's an engineer, so he's a data guy, and he was determined to have charts and graphs and, and prove that the system could work. So not only do we use it for um, weighing our animals on a regular basis, we don't weigh as much anymore because you know we've proven to ourselves, and that's all that mattered. We also use the scale because um, initially the slaughterhouses we were using did not have live weight scales. So we wanted to know what our live weight is was prior to bringing an animal to process. So the scale is optional, but certainly I find that the shoot in um, AI palpation area is key. Another fun thing that we got on our farm are these, this is called Moo Call. It's a company out of Ireland. It is a tail mounted labor detection device. So um, I was tired of getting up in the middle of the night. I had raised my, my, ba my own personal babies and I didn't like checking animals and we like the animals to stay where they are. So this is a great picture of a, one of the twins that was born this year. She was born out in our wooded lot. And so we want our mamas to, to cab where they are. And um, this allows us to still sleep or work and we get a text. So it detects the labor through the tail rhythm. And then we get a text to our cell phone or our email. Um, this is a, a dream item that I recommend to any farm if you can do it and find the time to do it. The, this is an on-demand geothermal water fountain. I got tired of chipping ice and um, scrubbing algae growth out in the summer of those big 100 gallon tubs. And so we researched and researched and researched, and this is a stainless steel bowl. It only holds a gallon of water. The water is not uh, groundwater, it is well water. The geothermal part is this is two, this concrete pipe is two con eight foot concrete pipes vertical. So that helps um, with freezing in the winter. So at any point in time, our cattle are getting 65 degree temped water, whether it's January or July. And so um, this has been an amazing, you know, lifesaver for me. And um, it's definitely healthy for the cattle. And we have two complete systems like this and are planning on putting a third one in. They do not fight over it. I know that's a frequent question we get. They quickly adapted to it and um, they take turns. So that's that's a good thing. 
So I'm going to talk briefly about our animals. As I mentioned, we have a herd of registered red Angus, but we didn't always. When we first started, we had white faced Herefords and um, black Angus. And we, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. We started with black Angus because, you know, the buzzword. People, consumers think that Angus is, you know, the way to go. But we suddenly learned that the, the line of Angus, black Angus that we had were um, not friendly. They were big framed. They um, were actually enormous. And so, you know, through our learning, we realized that that was not the right frame size for our model because on grass, you want them to be as efficient as possible. So you don't want your animals to be building a frame while they're eating their grass. You want them to be building themselves. So we want them to be as low to the ground, as low profiled as possible. Um, Red Angus is a commercial breed, so we feel that uh, for us at that time, this is what, you know, was a good match. Uh, Red Angus also has very strict criteria in terms of registration. So they actually are looking for um, docility scores. We are with our herd, like I said, every 12 hours. So we're touching them, talking to them. Um, and so that's really important. So here you go. So um, I included this picture of my boys on one of our cows because that's, a criteria for us. We have a young family and not that I want my children riding our cows, but it's here as a representation that um, our animals are safe and we trust them and our kids can hop on them. And um, that's important because, you know, we all know what beef breeds can be like. And so that's something that we work really hard for on our farm is a good, calm animal who's friendly and willing to be with you. Uh, we are also able to milk our cows by hand, um, whether we need to or for field trip purposes. So lots of different, um, agritourism is a big deal. So we wanna make sure that um, our farm is as, as diverse as possible. So fencing, it's pretty important. And I put this slide on the left-hand side here because my husband convinced me to get cows before we had our permanent fence in. And so I look at this and it almost gives me anxiety um, and a chuckle all at the same time. We had them in panels and I kept moving the panels from spot to spot. And I think, you know, it's important because I, I believe most, most of us can relate to this image, whether we did this particular thing or something else, but we always seem to, you know, as farmers have an idea to do something and we're not quite 100% there when we um, tackle something on. And then the fence on the right is, of course, um, an example of a corner that we have on our farm. And um, we now, you know, keep our, our ladies, I refer to all my cows as girls, even though our steers are mixed in with them. Um, fencing is a really important critical, critical thing. So back to the same Google image of my property. I have now put on, so as we mentioned, this is that original 2.5 acres in pink. So this is where our farm started. And what's, I love this image because you can see one of our winter methods, um, we bale grazed. So I really kind of like that you can see the round bales. We put them right on the ground. Um, and then this blue line that goes all the way around is 1.1 miles of new fence line that we put in in 2018, that we finished putting in in 2018. So for me, it's about my perimeter fence. So this is one enormous five, five line high tensile system. I think it has seven gates in it, uh, periodically placed through the system. And then what I do is, as you saw in my earlier grazing maps, is I divide this up into sections. And so when I am making my paddocks, give me a sec, I don't, know, I don't know what color this is gonna be, but we're gonna give it a try. When I make my paddocks, I put in pigtails, hope you can see me drawing, and then I run a single line to create a pen. Then I usually have an alley, water is here, so in this particular application, I would have the cows come out and go this way. Um, and so this is how I create 
um, interior lines. So one of the barriers that I was sharing is that I have to, those Gallagher reels are very, very heavy. And so they were intended to hang on a pretty heavy line. And so when I'm doing these interior things, I'm now in this section out in here, it's just a pigtail. It's a single pigtail or a ring post and it hangs on it. So that is a barrier that I have with the Gallagher's is that it doesn't allow me to continue my flexibility. If I was running it straight across the field from fence to fence, that would work just fine. But for me, I need to create um, paths so that the cattle can still get to their next watering system. So while I'm down here, we water here. While I'm in here, we water here. And then when I'm up front, we water up front. So that's kind of a quick capture of how we um, have our perimeter fence and then at any point I can change what I want. So um, you saw in some of my earlier plans, I grazed this way up the, up the line like that. And then you can also see how I switched it in a different year so I could do it differently. I then went this way with my interior paddocks. So I like the idea of having a very hefty perimeter fence so that inside I can do whatever my animals or my environment need. Um, and so I mentioned that because we will talk about what to do when you have wet situations. So what's in a pasture? Um, this is, you know, has changed for us. What we used to think was good pasture when we first started is not what you will find on our farm. It de definitely looks different. And just so you all know, I am well aware that a break is coming and we're doing really good on time. So um, we'll take a quick break after what's in a pasture. So um, as you can see, we have our herd. We also have a small flock of chickens that we move with our herd. So, you know, you're getting to see a kind of a really good capture right here about what we think is good right now in our pastures. So when we first started um, our farm, I mentioned that we had a pure stand of, stand of Timothy. And so that's this picture. And we thought that was what every farmer should achieve. You know, we, we were stupid. Um, I'm gonna just come out and say it. Um, we created this monoculture of one species. We heavily use, uh, applied commercial fertilizers to this field. As you know, if you know anything about Timothy, it is hungry for um, nitrogen and other products. So we were putting a lot into our fields to keep this crop the way it was. And um, we have partnered with NRCS and um, they supported our fence project. So I certainly wanna make sure that um, we mention that it's important to find ways to utilize resources to your advantage and then obviously to um, support your, your practices. And when they first came out onto our farm, you know, this, this area in, in essence, now that I look back on it was pretty dead. Even though the grass was growing um, and the crop was good, our soils were rock hard and, um, you know, there was runoff issues and it, this is difficult to maintain. And now on the right hand side, you'll see this picture and it was really hard to capture a picture of what our pastures look like. Um, now we want to see as much the species, grass species diversification as possible. So um, while I can't capture it in one picture, we probably represent between 25 to 35 different types of grasses um, or green, I'm just gonna say anything green above the surface. So we now know that the more green above the ground means the more going on beneath the ground. And as I shared earlier, how it was so hard to step in our pigtails, as we shifted from this philosophy to this philosophy, um, we had much better water saturation into our soils when it was raining. We, I was then able to step my pigtails in like butter. My children can do it. So these were like simple signs that we could see on our own farm, how our grazing practices started to change um, what we were doing and how we were doing it. So there was a question that got sent in about seeding. Do, did we ever seed? So the answer to that question is yes. We obviously seeded our Timothy um, and fertilized 
as often as it wanted. Um, but this, that initial 2.5 acres is this area you see back here. And we did plant that and we did a mixture. It was an alfalfa, an alfalfa perennial ryegrass, a tall fescue. And just for fun, we threw in Timothy. Um, and that was the only section on our property that we, we seeded for pasture purposes um, and everything else. So this is a picture of it this spring. So this is it in, I can't even remember, 2012, 10. Um, and now this is it this year. So um, that was pretty much the only thing we planted. So I mentioned that one in our video that I thought I needed permanent fencing. So this is a pigtail that we had in the middle and I quickly abandoned that. And now um, this is an example of one of those single paddocks within the outside. And so I'm just gonna share with you very briefly what a backline is because nobody explained that to me. So animals come in from this open section on the top. A backline is when you run, and I can't see it because I have a little box there. Hang on, let me see if I can move box. This, the circles represent my pigtails. I, I'm the only person who sets our fence system up because I do it based on my paces. So my system right now, each box is 20 by 30 paces um, for me. I, sorry, I didn't do the math out for you in feet, but I do it based on what my animals need, what I know that they can eat in 12 hours and then move them out. So in this back line, they come to this point, they eat here for 12 hours. And then at the end of the 12 hours, I go out, I move my back line to the next. Now they still have access up here. So the important, the most important thing I can mention about running a back line system is that you never want them in an area long enough. So two to three days, so I keep moving mine every 12 hours, every two to three days, because what will start to happen is at the three day marker, new growth will start coming in up here and then they'll start nipping at it. So you wanna make sure you can get them in and out of an area within two to three days. Um, otherwise they will start to go after that new growth. Um, I'm looking at the time. And so we're almost at 10, but we're, I wanna just wrap up the section. Um, this is a shot and I really love this picture because you can see my back line and how I moved it. So you can see how each 12 hours the grass gets, and so this is what they just got moved into, and then this over here will what they will move into um, later. This is a picture taken from two years ago, um, but I really liked how it showed the difference. Um, this over here on this far left-hand side, I will personally tell you that I feel that that got grazed too low, and that's why you can see it well in the photograph. Um, we don't graze this low anymore, um, and we'll discuss that in a minute. Okay, so here's a great example of um, high density tall grass and some 50% litter that we leave behind. So this is uh, the end of June, early July, if I recall correctly, and you can really see the height of the grass. And so we're going to talk about that um, also. One of the biggest drawbacks of um, high density tall grass grazing or tight and tall is in the early spring months, the cows will eat under this line. So this is my uh, interior divider, my creating my paddock, my single line, and the cows will eat under it. But come this time now, because it's this tall, they stop to eat under it. But you know what? There's a solution to every problem. And for me, I this they're seeding out. You can see that there are seed heads here. Not a big deal. We don't care anymore. Let it happen. It puts it back into the soil. And when I go to recreate this paddock in about 50 to 70 days, I just shift my line over a foot. And then that situation has been resolved all on its own. And I don't have to worry about it. Um, another area that we did uh, seed. This is a rice. We did rye in a section that we thought we were going to be. Um, you know, using for future purposes, we decided, heck, let's graze them. So this is uh, early April. We grazed it. We still took the rye off of it. And this is a picture I took a month ago on the right-hand side, same section. We have never put anything in it other than that rye seed. And this is a really lush pasture that by grazing our animals on it, using our animals, because we believe our animals are the mower, 
the feed wagon and the manure spreader. So we are using our animals to do all three of those jobs. And the product that we get is um, really amazing pastures and that's from Animal Impact. Another question that got sent in was about wooded lots. Um, we don't have a ton of wooded lot, but we do have some. This is an edge that we wooded. And so on the right hand side, this is last summer. First time they ever had access to this area. Obviously, we didn't clean up the trees very well. And this picture on the right hand side is a photograph of this year. So um, this was junk last year. They played in it. They messed it all up. This is the same exact picture, just a slightly different angle, by the way. Um, it was wet when we were in there. And this is what happened this year. So this is inside our wooded area. Um, this is what we would call our attempt at a silvo pasture. Uh, it's about five acres of land for us. Never ever put anything on the ground in here. And you can see on both the left and the right pictures, just by putting the animals in there, what it has done for um, growing species. The seeds are there, people. We just need to encourage them to grow. And so we use our animals to do that. Another, this is just another view of that wooded lot that we are um, using our animals to um, reseed. So we're gonna take a break right here, everybody. I understand that we're gonna take about a five minute uh, break use the bathroom, get a drink, and then we'll come back here at about 10.10, okay? The only other thing I'll add in addition to what Jenny just mentioned, if anybody is still on and hasn't stepped away yet, is if you have questions, for, certainly feel free to um, submit them in the chat and we will discuss those at the end of the webinar today. See everybody at 1010. Okay, I'm going to assume that my audio is all set. Um, if Mackenzie, can you just give me a confirmation that I can be heard? Yes, you're all set, Jenny. Thank you. Okay, so weeds. Let's talk about weeds. Um, so when we first kind of started shifting over to this and you know I want to re remind everybody this is a process we are not going to finish until we decide that we are stopping farming we will not get it perfect we every year we change something about what we're doing um, maybe sometimes we change more than a couple things based on what we've learned and and our you know what we do but um, I just want to remind everybody that this isn't you're, you're not going to get it right the first time and what might work on my farm might not work on your farm but weeds, this is an interesting conversation. So I have on the left hand side a picture. I took this a couple weeks ago. It will appear in the video we're going to watch next. So Mackenzie, maybe while we're working on this, you can work on getting the link ready uh, for video two, not the second video of the fencing, but the video two. Um, this is a weed. I would definitely call this a weed. I have no idea what it is. It's incredibly stocky. It has this hideous looking like yellowy gold flower on it and um i wouldn't want to eat it but it's only a weed if your animals don't eat it and so you can clearly see that the animals have gone in and eaten this um and they snipped it at about a seven to nine inch level so they ate a plant that i would clearly classify as something that is a weed and i will also mention something that might be worth your consideration the animals born on our farm so let's talk about the first animals that we bought and we brought to our farm those animals are the pickiest animals we have they are the ones who are searching through the grasses they are the ones who will pick through a hay bale and fling what they don't want but their daughters and offspring uh, and and bulls they eat a little more and so we are now at um the fourth or fifth generation born on our farm those animals eat almost everything and i say almost everything because as you can see the picture on the right is a picture of thistle and so the only things that our animals will not eat 
are the super pickies. So we do have some thistle. One year I was super busy um, working my job and um, we had a lot going on in our life. And I allowed some thistle to seed out. What a disaster. Um, so I have spent the next several years trying to eradicate um, the thistle outbreak. And how I have done that is I um, cut the plant. So that is a lot of manual labor, but I go out there and cut the plant. And then this year for the few remaining plants, um, we had a really nice exposure of them early and I did spot treat um, for a, the few remaining thistle plants. And this is one that I happened to miss and was able to include it in the slide here. So I'm gonna show you a picture and I want you to think about, hang on, I want you to look at this. And I know um, I can't see the chat when I'm in share mode, but you know, just on your own, sit and look at this and think about how it might make you feel. Um, think about how it looks to you. Does it look terrible? Does it look good? Does it have no response? Do you have no um, opinion about this particular picture? And with that said, Mackenzie has shared a link for you in the chat box. This is about a five minute and 30 second video clip. So I'm gonna give you a moment to head over to YouTube and play this. Okay, so it seems like most of you are finished up watching that video. I would like to make one editing correction. I guess I had Jim Garrish on the mind when I was walking out in the pasture that day. It was John Hibma who referred to our practice as tight and tall. So I certainly want to make sure that the appropriate credit is given. Um, but I must have been having Jim Garrish on the brain. Um, maybe when I was walking out in the pasture, um, I've been on a lot of grazing walks with him. So I probably that's why that was on my um, brain. But for me, when I see this picture, um, I see healthy, sustainable grasses. I even can see um, the organic matter and all the organisms beneath my dirt and so in my soil doing amazing work. So for me, this is a real positive picture. It, it leaves me feeling warm and fuzzy. I will be honest, it took my husband a very long time to arrive at this same moment with me. So we are probably as a couple, and this is important to know, we are probably about two years different in what our opinions are. So my husband takes a little longer, even though he's heard it, even though we you know, live together and talk and breathe this stuff all the time, he is a little slower to come around. And so, um, you know, he has to work through it as a process in his own mind. And so now when he sees this, he celebrates the work that we're doing on our farm and the benefits that it has not only for our soil health, but for the grasses to regrow and then for our animals to eat it. I will tell you, for those of you who kind of look at this, and, and I will tell people our farm looks unruly. You are never going to show up at my farm and see perfectly manicured grass it it well maybe in april um when it's first starting to grow but anytime thereafter you're going to come and see some version of this and you come about august and you're going to see it it's going to look even rougher um because by august now there is some uh debris left over that they haven't touched what i can tell you though is when i do my last graze in the october range they clean everything off so the cycle works. They they get to everything at the end. They eat what is left over, um, and it, it's good. So something else that we discovered when we went to the tight and tall method, and I just want to make sure, um, when we went to the tight and tall method, it kind of happened naturally. Um, and as I shared in the video, that was a question, like, what do you do when the grasses get unruly? We don't care anymore um, because this is what we want to have happen. We want our animals to go into a paddock to spend, for me, I can manage 12 hours. We want them to spend 12 hours in there. We want them to nip the tops or sometimes they will eat lower to the ground. And we view that as a way that the animal is managing their own diet so there was a time where when we were grazing really short grasses so for us really short is like under 10 inches um 
when we were grazing under 10 inch grasses, our animals manure was like runny. Their systems were, you know, it was just going, that high protein was just going right through them. So we would offer them dry hay. Well, they never ate any of the dry hay because why would they eat dry hay when they have really high quality forage out in the pasture? When we switched over and went into this tight and tall method, so I'm now talking about the tall grasses, they're manure started to regulate their system started to regulate on their own because now they're getting multiple portions of the plant so they're getting the high fibrous drier portions in the taller stockier stuff yet they still have access to the lower growth um, that's happening should they want it and i am not a um, animal nutritionist i am just telling you what i have seen happen on my farm and the benefit it does for my animals so it's all about the rest. So for us on our farm, this is, I would say is, you know, besides our perimeter fence, this is, this is the take home. So when I found out that this was going to go virtual, I said, you know what, I have an opportunity here. And as I shared in the beginning, I ran around and pushed stakes into a variety of different paddocks. So since I have grazing charts, I knew where I was going to be going. So I was able to pre-plan for you all and put stakes in. So it's all about the rest. So I hope that you are able to um, view my next few slides as they were intended, and I hope that you can see them okay. I am not, I'm a photographer, but let me tell you, I did not get on the right angle every time, so they're not perfect, but you're gonna see. So um, this was the very first paddock I grazed, and I was able to graze on April 24th this year. We had a really nice early growth start to our season. So I was able to start grazing on April 24th in a safe way. Now, remember people, I was not able to start taking these pictures because I didn't know that until May 12th. So the first couple pictures I snapped started on May 12th. So on the left-hand side here, um, you'll see I, I have a pigtail. That's so I know I go back to the right place. So I leave my um, uh, pigtail there and then I just bring my grazing stick out. Um, I was so thankful I kept my grazing stick for this purpose um, because, like I said, I don't normally use it. So you can see here, this is eight, 18 days post-graze, 25 days post-graze, 32 post-graze, days post-graze, 39 days post-graze, and then um, this was taken yesterday. So um, you're now seeing that, um, I believe that looks like Timothy that has shot up above the grazing stick. We have clover, that, that red clover is over two feet tall in this particular pasture. Um, there was a time when we, and I can't even believe that I'm gonna admit this, there was a time we actually sprayed to eliminate our clover population when we were in our Timothy field. And now my husband and I chuckle at that. We're like, what were we? thinking um we also don't use any kind of um sprays on our our fields we feel that um you know there that is not a practice that we do on our fields so we are thrilled that our clover has come back um and thrives and it's wonderful how the species of plants you know it changes it ebbs and flows you know we have a different kind of variety in the spring. We have our summer grasses that take off because they are more um, drought tolerant. So this is the before and after of that. So you're actually looking at um, the cell on the left side of this line. I didn't think to take the picture the same way. And then this, of course, was it yesterday. Um, and I am probably a good solid 30 days, 25 to 30 days before they're going to come back in here. Um, I still have plenty of grazable acres left. So here's just another example, same example, eight days post graze. So you're getting it to see it closer to the ground here. Um, this is 15 days post graze. You can see the clovers taking off in here. And then of course, 36 days post graze, this was yesterday. So before on the left, yesterday on the right. So this one um, I included because, you know, while your first, couple paddocks are grazed early, you have other paddocks that are just sitting and waiting. So, and and I, um, the rename six was then how I, um, the rename six was, these are those Timothy fields that my husband still mowed last year and I haven't renamed them yet. And, and maybe I never will, maybe it'll always be renamed six. 
So this is 18 days since the start of grazing season. So um, think about the numbers a little bit differently. So 18 days ago, animals started grazing somewhere on the farm. Um, and now this is 20 days in the day it grazed. So then this is in the morning. They got into that paddock in the morning. And this is 12 hours later um, that I pulled them out of it. So I also want to point out that this is, I want to say, Oh, so it's May, four, May 14th. So on May 14th, they're grazing it a little lower to the ground. Um, it's For me, this is an area that we've never done very well. Uh, everybody I talk to says, get them in, get them out early fast. And I haven't mastered that yet. So that is the spring grasses, trying to get them in to nip the tops, get them in and out early. And it gets away from me and you know i used to worry about it years ago and now i don't care um if it gets away from me oh well but i would like to see if i could move the herd faster quicker and and do that initial nip faster but again i have to balance my job so um you know that that's where it comes down to so 12 hours later then this is 12 days post graze 19 days post graze post days graze and then this is finally yesterday at 26. so the day they grazed and yesterday. Um, this section is that section of, um, that was Timothy, that my husband still mowed a first cut last year. And I'm gonna tell you, if you came out to our farm, it's gonna look like one of the more underperforming areas because it is it has not had the same animal impact as some of our other paddocks. So that was really the telling sign for my husband to make that final push that we had to stop mowing. Um, Jim Garrish writes a book, Kick the Hay Habit, and they don't mean stop feeding your animals hay. They mean stop selling your solar energy is really what it comes down to. So we are now keeping everything that we do on our own farm is for our animals exclusively. And we um, lease land and partner with another farm to produce the hay that we need for our winter. So let me get back to my slide. So here's just another slide of the same, um, same kind of content. You got, you're getting the drift just here, but I, I guess I got really happy over it. Um, just to prove, I, I included this one in here just so that you could see I was still taking pictures of the same spot. In the background here, you see some hay bales. So they're in every picture. So at least you know that I legitimately was taking pictures in the same spot. Um, but you'll see how on this side, these, this was day 32 was the day we grazed. So from the start of graze, they didn't get into this paddock until day 32. And so here you have a nice, that was on May 12th, I took the picture, the day they grazed it, I took the picture and then what it looked like yesterday. So um, I hope I kind of captured the importance of rest. Um, somebody had shot a little message about 66 days. So when I look back at my records from last year, in terms of um, rest periods, I had rests, some rests were over 70 days. And so I, um, and you know, I partner with NRCS and they hand out a really um, handy chart about, you know, you should rest this many days in May, you should rest this many days in, um, those are suggestions. And so, you know, it, you have to find what works for your farm. And so, we are okay letting our grasses go tall. We will not mow. You know, we feel very strongly that it will right itself every year. Our cow, you know, you have to be patient. Our cows will finally graze it in October and we'll clean it up. Um, that is more nutritious, that stuff that's standing than anything I can give them in a bale. So um, I hope that, you know, it, it changes. And so a question came in about supplemental feed. And so I'm gonna tell you that on our farm, we do not feed anything except grasses and baleage. Um, so grasses are roughly May 1st to November 1st, and we do not supplement during that period. Um, our animals are always given a free choice mineral cafe, and that includes salt, kelp, and garlic. We use garlic um, as an attempt for fly control. That is an area that we struggle with on our farm because we do not want to use a chemical on our cows because that will in turn impact our soil health. So we're, that, you know, that's a constant battle for us is um, fly management, but we use alfalfa pellets for training and reward. So our children do show our animals um, 
And, you know, it, it's hard to shake a bale of hay when you get a cow that gets out of the pasture. So it's always kind of nice to have something that can shake in a bucket. So we use alfalfa pellets for that. So that's roughly, you know, so it's grass and then it's baleage. Um, our baleage is, um, like I said, we make it, we lease it our, our field and we make it ourselves. We mow at night and we bale and wrap and have it in wrap in 18 hours um, that, you know, we try to bail it around 50 to 60%, 60, 60, sometimes a little more. We really want a wet wrap bale. And um, that is, you know, beneficial to the growth and maintaining and actually continuing weight gains through the winter for us. So that's supplemental feeding. All right, moving on. Soil and forage testing was a question that came up and I was so very fortunate a few years back to be able to participate in a study that was being done by UConn's extension. Um, uh, they reached out to me and I was happy to hop on board because, you know, we want to, we are willing to participate in everything because we want people to see that our animals can be fed, can maintain um, two, sometimes we can maintain three pounds a day weight gain on grasses alone um, when done you know, when we can move our animals appropriately, you know, we can push that three pound marker consistently. So we have done soil and forage testing. Um, for those of you who don't know, that was an example. That was um, how you do a forage test. So this is a dry matter um, test that was completed on us. This is the picture from the cells that they were done in. Um, and so we are farm 19 down here. And that is this area over here. Let me get my over here so that is this box right now let me switch this please forgive me so that is this box right here so thank you for waiting with me all right so this is pre-graze so we happen to do two separate times on our farm we did two pre-graze studies and then we did um what was left after we pulled them out so I am not a scientist and I'm not gonna butcher it. So I'm just gonna talk about the numbers themselves. But if you see this number 3,800, that was the when they were going into a paddock. And when they came out of it, there were 1,700 pounds per acre, I think, dry matter pounds per acre left over. That's 50%. So we, you know, for us, we celebrate over this number because, you know, it's not a science. I don't go out there and, you know, I don't do animal units because it doesn't make sense to me. I, I know what it means, but I'm not out there calculating how much my animals weigh. And, you know, when I first started it, I panicked over that. I panicked that I had to understand it all and get it right. And you know what I found out? It doesn't matter. I look at my animals now and go, this is what my animals need. And this is what they can eat in this time frame. And now I know how to do that. So don't stress over getting the science part of it right. It's, it's about trial and error and going, wow, I let them stay in there too long or whoa, I pulled them out wicked fast and now I have probably 80% litter behind. So when I look at this number, I celebrate that, wow, we are, you know, we have it down. I am pulling my animals out. I am leaving that 50% litter behind. That 50% litter is vital to the regrowth of my, my hay, my pastures. It keeps my soil moist because it's canopied in July. We have zero issues with regrowth during droughts because we keep that canopy, that litter is on the ground. And so our um, pastures flourish all season long. So I am never worried that we are not gonna have enough food for our animals during the growing season because of that practice of leaving litter behind. We also do soil tests. So I have reports for our farm for 2009, 2011, 2014, 2019. So roughly a three year cycle for everything. So this was the one that we did last August. And um, I wanna point out about our pH. So we personally believe that our pH has changed over time because of our very heavy use of nitrogen. When we, so I'm going back to when we were, had that Timothy only stand and we were applying nitrogen at an alarming rate. And um, so now we are working at correcting our pH levels so that they are back into an optimal range because they are not across our, our acreage. And so, um, 
you know, it's always important that, you know, what you think might have a good short term gain can actually impact your long term performance. So, you know, before you go put something on your, your fields, think about what it could have in a long term effect. And we didn't know when we were using that high volume of nitrogen, we didn't think twice about it. We were like, oh, look, it greened up. It looks great. The early growth is perfect. You know, we were excited about it. But now that we have changed our model and that we are exclusively grazing, you know, we kind of are frustrated with ourselves that we did such a practice. Um, but, you know, we live and learn and now we know more. And now we are working very hard to letting our animals do all the work for us. But it is our responsibility to make sure we can correct that pH. So, um, winter and wet management. So, as I shared earlier, we only feed our cattle our baleage through the winter months. And so, um, but we do have wet seasons. This picture was taken this season. Um, so, I want to point something out to you. When you keep good grazing records, when you make notations about your property, you know, you will know, you will become an expert at where the drainage is poor or where your soil type is slightly different or where you have, um, you know, some standing water. So I'm gonna tell you on our property, this section over here, and you can see we have some sort of funky, wet, loving, product growing in there, it's wet. And so I know ahead of time that when I start my grazing season, I have to avoid this until at least mid-June. So I will tell you that this morning, I opened this section up by the road up here and our cattle are now over here. Um, and they're gonna come back in this direction. So wet management for me is about knowing and I'm talking about wet management when you know you have a water drainage issue, not when you get rain overnight. So I'm talking about that long-term problem that you're working on, you know, finding a solution for on your property, planning ahead for that. Um, generally speaking, if we have a solid overnight rain, it only becomes a problem if I'm right in here. So, you know, that's a risk I take. And then what would happen is if I got a heavy rain, overnight, I mean, and I'm talking significant rain, um, inches, I would then just go to another paddock and then mark that on my grazing records and come back to it when it's dry. So, you know, you can clearly see in this picture, I have lots of, and this is just a small portion of our property, I have lots of opportunity to move my herd to continue to graze them when I might have a water impact problem. So that's how we handle um, wet stuff. So now let's talk about winter management. So as you saw, we don't have infrastructure for a barn. And, um, you know, we have contemplated and we continue to contemplate a bedded pack barn system for ourselves. But we also feel that there's huge value to winter grazing in a controlled method. So um, we, this is one year we tried this. So this was a, our herd was smaller. We certainly couldn't do this now. Um, we took a bale feeder and we literally pushed it around all winter long on the property, on a particular section. So that way the animals were feeding out of a hopper. It reduced the amount of um, litter or leave behind that they had. You can clearly see that we were heavy on the black Angus at the point of this picture. So on the right hand side, I kind of show you a manure distribution, but I also want to point out, you have to be very cautious about doing this kind of method. And I will tell you that by the time spring came around, this was very overgrazed compared to the side on the left. And it took a lot longer for this section to rebound in the spring. So um, I've learned a lot from how we did it in this method. You know, I kind of kept them in this paddock for six months and just kept moving the feeder around. But you know animals, they're gonna keep going and looking for any little sprig of grass that they can find. And they had this pretty right down to the dirt. So I changed my practice. Also, what happened at the end of this year, and I think you all can appreciate this, this was that year that I swear it rained from like January until June. And um, this is not inside our pasture, but this was, um, we couldn't even get our equipment into the pasture to feed them anymore. It got so wet that we were dumping hay bales over our fence line just to get them into the paddock where the animals were at. And so I think we can, you know, we've all been in this boat where we have struggled to 
feed our animals. At least we did um, because obviously we don't have a gravel base here. There's no road going into our paddock at this time. Um, so this was so I needed to shift how I did things. So the following winter, I said, you know what? I'm going to bale graze right on the ground. So I created um, strips and then I ran. A, let me see if I can show you how I did that. So I ran a line in between each bale so that they only had access to one bale at a time. It also helped my husband travels on business a lot. So this was very helpful for me in terms of um, being able to manage the system if I couldn't get equipment running because um, it's winter. I'm a woman. Um, I'm usually feeding the animals in the dark because I've gotten home from work and you know how that goes. So this worked well, but guess what? An immense amount of waste. Uh, this was not an effective measure for us because after a little bit, the animals started to bed in it and then they wouldn't be interested in eating. So we lost a lot in feed. So then fast forward to this past winter. Um, I don't know why we didn't think of it sooner, but we happen to have an older style hay trailer that has head slats. And so we kind of had this epiphany one day walking and we're like, we are going to use this hay trailer. So we put three round bales in it. It lasts us about five days on this on fifth. This is 15 animals right here. It lasts us about five days and then we were able to move that hay trailer every five days to a new section. We were able to move. So I pre planned and put pigtails in the ground before winter froze. So I had all kinds of paddocks that we could keep the animals in to minimize eating to the ground. So this is an example on the right hand side about how the manure distribution was just around that trailer in a nice circular format. Just another example, we moved it into that um, silvo pasture area so that our cows could have some time in there and you get to see a representation. We offer them a variety. This is a really incredibly wet wrapped clover bale. That was second cut. This is a dry first cut, you know, a first cut so it's definitely more fibrous and then this was a second cut so we were able to to vary it so this is just a before manure distribution and this was it this spring how it came in and looked at, again this is a section of pasture we have never seeded so complete completing uh, finishing on grass loan it is completely possible um this steer we i will tell you um we can get our animals to be at a weight gain we like at 18 months we can get to about 11 to 1200 pounds at 18 months, but we don't finish at that point because we personally do not like the flushing. So, you know, it's a balance. You have to decide, you know, you can get the weight gain you want, but do you get the fat content you want? So we personally like to finish an older animal. Um, this particular animal happened to be um, almost three years old and he was 1630 on the hoof when we brought him in this spring. And this happens to be a steak from this steer. So really quickly, this is, um, so as I said, my husband's a data guy, he crunches numbers. So um, I have a sample of two animals. The black dotted line is the slope for a two pound per day gain. So think about it, the slope, it's the slope that we're looking at, not necessarily, you know, where it is. And so the colors, the boxes or the check marks are the data points. So um, we try to weigh every two weeks, but that doesn't always happen. The more data points you have, the more accurate, but you can clearly see this is on mama. This is over three pounds a day of weight gain. This is wean. We wean at about day 180. So you can see they kind of plateau a little bit and then they take off again on their own. And then this is now mature animal up here where they plateau again. Oh, this was just a slide about fence line weaning. Where do we go from here? So this was a question about like, what do we do on our own farm and, and what changes are we gonna make? So as I shared, we are always going to grow and learn. We're not done. This is not a science and we're and it's not a secret and we're willing to share it. And we're willing to learn alongside other people. So um, we believe, you know, I'm an educator. So I always believe that, you know, we always have something to learn. We can always do something better. We can always be, um, a better farmer, a better grazer, a better, better animal steward. So where we would like to go from here is stockpiling. And so we have to do this obviously cautiously and respectfully because we certainly don't want to have animals um, on our on wet 
sloppy, muddy ground in the wintertime. But we would love to try to stockpile, you know, three foot tall grasses and see what that can happen and how we can extend our grazing opportunities into the winter. Like I said, with a respectful mind to the fact that the ground needs to be frozen to have animal impact on it. Um, we also want to increase our chicken capacity. So we want to build another mobile coop so that they can follow our herds. So that is for fly reduction. And then I shared this picture of calves because we as a farm have decided we want to um, explore a different breed. We want to try a heritage breed and see how that goes. We also want to do um, crossbreeding, so hybrid vigor. Um, so, oh, um, to answer a question that just came through about that picture about the plateau at the end, those happen to be females I was showing you. Um, that was the quickest, easiest slide on that last graph. These are females. So um, that's why they still have some data points. Um, so that's where we're going in terms of our breed. Uh, we want to crossbreed, obviously continuing to use our AI practices, but crossbreeding between Devons and our Red Angus. So um, we are bringing uh, Red Devon heifers onto our farm to increase that. We feel it's a good match and a good combination of the two breeds. And so we'll see where that goes. So that is all I have. So let me stop sharing my screen. And I believe we are open to questions and answers. Question Q&A time. So if anybody has a question. I'll get you started on one that came in, um, I think actually before our break, but um, uh, first I'll mention if anybody has questions, go ahead and type them into the chat now. And as they come in, I will um, relay them over to Jenny and Jenny can answer them for us. Um, right, so before you, before you ask me that question, and I, because I'm just not sure if people are going to hop off at this point now that we're in Q&A, but I know that this farm tour couldn't happen in person because of the COVID-19 restrictions, but um, we always want to extend learning and growth and knowledge to anybody. So if anyone participated on this call and this webinar and would like to call me personally to come out to the farm, um, we welcome you. We welcome you at any growing season on our farm. So if anyone is interested in making a private appointment to come visit with us, um, we are happy to accommodate that. And we hope that it was beneficial to those who have stayed on this farm. So Q and A. Thank you, Jenny. And hopefully in the future, um, COVID doesn't have complete control of, of everything uh, moving forward. And we can maybe, you know, plan for something as a follow up to today's presentation or to focus and look at something, um, you know, up close uh, uh, on a specific topic. So more to that, more on that to come. Um, the other thing too is after Q and A, we will do a quick post evaluation. So if everybody who's on the line would be willing to stay on the line for just a few more minutes, um, we'll wrap up somewhere around ten or a few minutes after, or rather eleven. Sorry about that. Or a few minutes after, um, it would be much appreciated so that we know what direction to take as we're moving forward um, in the future. All right, Jenny, so the first question that I have for you is, have you ever measured light density in the woods versus grazing yield for that amount of sunlight penetration? No, we have not officially measured the light density in the woods, um, but I can tell you, so this is where, you know, and I wanna point back. So I, my husband's an engineer, I'm an educator. So we know that there is always a science or a, a method behind it, but you know what? Nothing replaces um, watching. And so I have a friend out of New York. Um, he's, he coined the term linger grazing. And, um, you know, this is a really good application of that. And I know that what the person was asking, but when you actually just sit and look and watch, you can learn so much information by watching your animals and how they eat and what they're eating. And then when you go into the woods during certain points of your day, you can see visually, there's no test. So I have no test to back up anything that I'm saying, but you can just see that the light doesn't always hit the floor. Now, we don't have 30% canopy. So I know that that, you know, is kind of like a benchmark. Um, and we're gonna really work hard at thinning it. But if someone wants to come out here and have at it, then you know I welcome anybody who wants to come test something and and steer me in another direction because we are always looking to make change. Well, 
Emily, another another question that's coming up. Um, it's saying, do you use your forest slash silvo pasture in within your grazing rotation in your uh, what I'm thinking is in within your grazing plan, one of those paddocks? Yes. So um, right now it's so I and I I'm gonna see if I can do this super quick. So please bear with me if I can get back to I hope I'm not making anyone sick or if you're on the video, I apologize later. All right, so this so this area right here, I hope everybody can see this on the screen. This is what we refer to as our Silvo pasture area and then this one over here. So, um, as you can imagine, with trees being in there, it's a little harder to kind of like run interior fence lines. So right now I am running these as bigger paddocks. Um, these out here in the field are obviously much smaller. I mean, the paddock that they're in right now is a little larger than a basketball court. If that kind of helps you kind of visualize, you know, 20 animals basketball court um, with 50% litter left behind. So in here, yes, these are part of our rotations. Um, um, we do them early in the early growing season. So they were in here right away before we started the official grazing season and they will come back here. So as you can see, I started here, went up here. I'm in here. I now came back into here. I'm then going to bring them down this back line. We're going to graze in this area. That was rye. You can actually see that that was mowed. And then we're going to come into these areas. So. The, right now, there's not a huge in, uh, nutritional impact in there for them, so I don't want them to be in there for too terribly long, and I want to make sure I time it correctly. So um, I'm going to mention that when we wait, weigh our animals regularly, we always see a dip in August, and that always correlates to the temperatures. So we want to make sure that when we hit those August temps, that our animals are on some of our best pastures so that they are getting the highest nutritional content that they can because they're not grazing as much because it's so hot. Um, and I didn't mention that our cattle have access to our pastures 24 hours a day. So in the summertime, if you sit and watch your animals, they will graze all night long on those super, and I'm talking like the 90, 95, pushing 100 days. They'll graze all night long and lay all day long. Um, and that's fine on our farm, but that's another practice that we do do is allow them to have access 24 hours a day. So I, I hope I answered that, but it is our Silvo area is in our rotation. It just cannot be viewed as the same nutritional capacity as everything else. Any other questions, Rachel? I don't see any coming through. If anybody has some, um, go ahead and enter them now uh, into the chat box. Jenny, in the meantime, I actually have a question that I'm curious of. I know that you um, had mentioned some things about the future and the direction you guys want to go um, in terms of, of crossbreeding and, and uh, hybrid vigor. Are you looking to grow your herd at all in terms of numbers? Um, yeah. Yes. Okay. Do you want to elaborate so, a little bit on that and how that might work with, you know, making sure that you have enough feed to carry that whole herd and, and such? Yep. So um, how we're using our baseline to know how big our herd can grow is obviously we know how many fenced in grazable acres we currently have. And so right now we have about 33, it's like 33 to 35 acres. You cannot use the same formula that um, has historically been used as a one acre per cow when you do such intensive grazing. It Those those numbers don't really apply. And I, I would love to see someone who's done a study about intentional, you know, intensive grazing practices and how the numbers can flush out, but they are different. I will tell you from practice, they are different. So we have to keep in mind our footprint. We can certainly expand if we wanted to. Um, and then we also have to be mindful that while we would love our farm to sustain us, as an income. The reality is, is that we had to invest so much money into our initial purchase. Um, we bought raw property and had to build a home on it. And, um, you know, we don't wanna go broke on our farm either. So this is a, a common challenge of younger farmers who, you know, maybe didn't stand in line to inherit something or, or have a passion. So we have to balance all of those factors together. So we feel that our footprint can sustain about 40 head. 
And so we also feel that that's about the amount of animals that we can handle in terms of maintaining our current careers. So it's all about that balance. So that's where we're headed right now. Um, I will also mention that we are partnering with another producer. So um, how we are going to reduce the animal load that we have in the winter, and I didn't mention this earlier, but in, in our plans for the future, how we're going to reduce our animal load through the winter is we are going to sell weaned calves to a grass producer who will take them off of our farm and put them into a larger market. So we feel for us, that's a nice way to reduce the numbers of head we have on any given time at our farm through the winter, but it still allows us to retain our um, direct market population so that we can still continue to finish on our own farm as well as have a revenue, a financial revenue at another time of the growing season, if that makes sense. Yeah, it sure does. So it's about keeping, um, I, I think every producer understands the need to make sure that you are diversified enough and that you have um, cash flow coming in from a variety of sources. Um, and so for us, we feel that that's a nice way to continue to keep our meat in a grass fed um, manner so that we're continuing to supply to the nutritional food chain of the country because that we can't do by ourselves and that we continue to direct market to our local um, consumers. Great. Um, so I have, go ahead. Go ahead, Jenny. No, go ahead, Rachel. I don't see any other questions coming in. Um, so at this point, I was thinking that we could just uh, wrap up by. <laughs> Before you start, I have been getting some private um, messages to me directly, so I'm going to address a couple of them. Sure. Um, so, you know, we all struggle as producers to find things that match our um, mission. So I, I challenge every farm to make sure they have a mission and vision. You know, you want to make sure that, you know, if you heard something here that you can apply on your farm, I am so excited, you know. But I don't expect you to any other producer to adopt the same values that we have on our farm. But I want to make sure that as a producer, you always stay true to the values that you have established for yourself. And um, for us, we have really struggled in the department of finding a uh, finding a processing facility that could meet our personal goals. And so we didn't, while I know the, the bulk of this conversation was about what our practice is on our farm, nothing was more frustrating as a grass only producer to have our product ruined in the last two weeks. Um, and so I just want to mention that here that, you know, we have been to, um, I think we're on our fifth USDA facility. And so, um, and, and, you know, I challenge everybody to make sure that you continue to, if you are a producer and you care and value your product, make sure that you're processing at a, at a facility that meets your needs and don't stop looking until you have found what you are looking for. Remembering that there are going to be bumps and hiccups at any place. But, you know, we didn't talk anything about harvesting. I'm sure you've covered it or will cover it, or maybe you won't cover it because this is all about um, sustainable agriculture. But it is not It is a barrier that producers face. So I just felt that um, I should mention that, you know, make sure you look and search for where you um, feel that it's best to process your animals and make sure that you're getting the outcome that you need. And um, I can tell you that we have been at a new facility for us um, I think we've been there now a year and a half or so, and we are very pleased with um, what is, you know, that our product is our product at the end of the day, because nothing's worse than hearing on a telephone call that your animal won't be returned to you. So, um, and that's not where we're at, but that was where we had visited at one point or another. But I, I mentioned that because it is an important aspect of what um, we do as producers. And I do appreciate, um, some of the, I see that um, Nick posted that there is a recording online recording system. So thank you, Nick. I'm going to definitely check that out um, and see what that looks like in terms of online grazing um, record keeping. So I do appreciate that. So if anyone else didn't happen to catch that, he did post that to everybody. And I think I've captured everything that has happened in this, my, my personal 
So I see Mackenzie has posted an evaluation link um, in the chat box. So I know Rachel, I don't know if you have any closing thoughts. Um, aside from thanking you very much for your time and your efforts on this, um, Jenny, I, I hope that everybody found it uh, today's webinar to be very useful. As I mentioned, we will have another one coming up in August and some other educational opportunities um, for people to take advantage of um, coming up throughout the summer. So we will get an, an email out, announcement out to everybody on that. Uh, in the meantime, if before jumping off, you wouldn't mind uh, just clicking the post evaluation link, um, the again, Slido, um, entering the access words there or access code rather, SARE, uh, answer those questions so that I can use that information and feedback uh, to better enhance our project moving forward. And with that, I thank everybody for joining us today and we look forward to interacting again in the future.